have your Bibles, I want you to look at 2 Corinthians 3 with me. The more I talk within the body of Christ, not necessarily our church, but within the greater body of Christ, one thing that stands out in almost all my conversations with people is that the church of Jesus Christ in the church age does not understand the new covenant. It is the covenant of our faith. And I am amazed how little teaching is done about the new covenant and how much teaching is done about the old covenant. So, it kind of, I don't know how they ignore the fact that when you do the Lord's Supper or the Eucharist, communion, however you want to describe it, that you lift the cup of the new covenant in the blood of Christ. I mean, every time the church of Jesus Christ takes part in the Eucharist, it should say that the new covenant has replaced the old covenant. We're not. This is not the cup of the old covenant. It is the cup of the new covenant. Why are you going back to the old covenant for anything? It is obsolete. It is obsolete. Fade. It has faded away and vanished. The only people keeping it alive are those in the church who think the old covenant has value to the Christian life. It has absolutely no value to the Christian life. The writer of Hebrews made this crystal clear in chapters 8, 9, and 10. I've gone over that with you in great detail. The apostle Paul has made this very clear in his teaching in 2 Corinthians, the third chapter. That is the chapter that we're going to look at today. I'm going to look at specifically uh, certain verses, but for sure we're going to look at that. The new covenant is absolute everything. And so we're going to talk about the blood of the new covenant. We have been in a study on the cup of the Eucharist. Because the writer Paul, in 1 Corinthians 11.35, I have it at the top of your paper, wrote this. And it is obvious that we don't understand that. So we're trying to bring clarity to it. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, you can read about this actual in Luke 22.20, this cup, is the new covenant in my blood. Now, the cup he was holding was the cup of shadow Christology of the old covenant, animal blood business. And he said, do this. He said, now there's going to be a change. This cup now is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Now, what you should be remembering is the blood of the cup. Agreed? That, I make it, didn't make it up, people. That's just what it says. What does that mean? What are you to remember about the blood in the cup that believers drink, which is the cup of salvation? The cup that Jesus drank of the old covenant were the sins of mankind. The cup that we drink of the new covenant is salvation from that sin. There are nine things that we have discussed that we should remember when taking the cup of the Eucharist. We have talked about reconciliation by the blood of Christ, redemption by the blood of Christ, uh, justification by the blood of Christ, a propitiation by the blood of Christ. Um, I, put, I wrote them all down there. Peace with God, 
with, through the blood of Christ, forgiveness through the blood of Christ, victory in the angelic conflict through the blood of Christ, and the new covenant. We're under the new covenant because we're under the blood of Jesus Christ. We are not under the old covenant. It was done away with when Christ held that cup and said, I'm going to the cross for you. I'm going to die on that cross. I'm going to be buried and raised on the third, the th third day. And that old cup is out and the new cup is in. Why you go back to the old covenant for anything is beyond my understanding. We are new covenant. This is the church age. We are under the new covenant. We are not under the old covenant. So Paul grabs this information. So let's have a word of prayer, and we're going to get after this this morning. We're going to try to clear up a lot of confusion. Do not go back to the old covenant. The old covenant is out. If you believe that Christ died on that cross for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead, the veil of the temple has, was, was rent when he died, right? Who does not know Matthew 27, 51? And why did God rent the veil that separated the holy place from the holies of holies? Where the Ark of the Covenant was, where atonement took place, where the blood was sprinkled on the mercy seat. Kaput, gone, replaced by the death of Christ on the cross, burial and resurrection called the gospel. Go back to the old covenant. It's got nothing to offer you. Nothing to offer you. Nada. Nothing. Let's pray. The Bible is a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. Can't be learned nor lived in carnality. Evidence of carnality is personal sin, mental attitude sin, sins of the tongue and overt sin should be confessed in silence and privacy prior to study. 1 John 1, 9 is proof text. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us. Allows the Holy Spirit to teach you the truth, and the truth is what sets you free from lies of the cosmic system of the devil. And so, our Father, we thank you today for your love, mercy, and grace. We pray the Holy Spirit would minister, for we have confessed our sins, have brought ourselves to a place where the Holy Spirit can minister. Spirituality is greater than morality. The new covenant is greater than the old covenant. That is for sure. For we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Well... Last week, we looked at five Messianic covenants. I can't tell you how important this is. If this is your first visit with me, then you'll need to go back and study last week's sermon as we dealt with the five Messianic covenants that are very important. Two of those covenants are conditional and three are unconditional. The unconditional covenants we studied was the Damic covenant don't eat of the tree in the day you eat, die, and you will die business. And the Mosaic, the Mosaic covenant of shadow Christology pointing to Christ. Galatians, the third chapter, 24 and 25. The conditional covenants lead you to Christ. Unconditional covenants, Christ leads you to the covenant. The new covenant, the new covenant, you come to Christ and he leads you to the new covenant. This cup is a new covenant in my blood. When you come, I never heard of the new covenant until I got saved. I'd heard of the old covenant because everybody pushed it down your throat. The Big Ten, they push the Big Ten on you. Which is a, a commandment of morality that nobody can keep. 
the new covenant is not about moral. It's about spiritual. The moment you believe the gospel of Christ, you're indwelt by the third member of the Godhead, and you are a, you are a spiritual person. No, and everybody who believes the gospel gets the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit makes them spiritual. Spirituality trumps morality. The new covenant trumps the old covenant. You're not spiritual because you keep morals, that you're a moral person. That don't make you spiritual. It makes you moral. What you need to be under the new covenant is spiritual. You need to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Just because you're a moral person doesn't make you spiritual. In fact, it doesn't even make you religious. Unless you're getting it from the old covenant. Even then, it doesn't equal spirituality. Spirituality trumps morality. The new covenant trumps the old covenant. And boy, you've got to come to understand this stuff. You're always bargaining with God under the old covenant. You're tithing and everything else, always to gain favor with God, that somehow he's going to bless you if you do that. That's not how it works under the new covenant. You need to read 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 if you want to know about giving under the new covenant. Quit going to Malachi to learn about giving. You need to understand this stuff. You're new covenant people. Quit going to the old covenant for any favor with God. The favor for God is completely grace-oriented, not law-indicated. You don't go to the law to learn it. You go to Matthew all the way to Revelation if you want to look at it. Because the new covenant comes with Jesus Christ. So we're going to talk about this today. We're going to talk about it. I want to show you the first thing why the new covenant is important. Look at point number one. I wrote it out so you didn't have to write it. For sure, look at it. The new covenant is the last messianic covenant. It is the last of the Messianic covenants. The new covenant is the end. There are no more. If there's any more, he'll tell you when you get to the new heaven and new earth. Because until then, the new covenant covers you. The new covenant covers the first coming and the second coming of Christ. That's New Covenant. That's Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34. It covers the first coming of Christ. It covers the second coming of Christ. That's New Covenant. So let's take a look at that. Here are some highlights. I gave you six highlights from each of them. Each of them. This is New Covenant highlights. This is not Old Covenant. This is New Covenant highlights. Here's what the new covenant's all about. When you look at the first coming of Christ, you're looking at his incarnation. Him coming, leaving heaven and coming into the world. You're looking at Luke 1 through 3. You're looking at the, at the earth Messiah ministry. Like Luke 4, 16 through 20, which is quoted, he quotes out of Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. He said, here are the signs of, of the Messiah on earth. Here's how you know who the guy is. And he lays it out in his home synagogue in Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. Miracles was a big part of that. And, of course, the trumping of it was him dying on the cross. The third thing is the suffering servant. He fulfills that. Isaiah 41, this Isaiah 41, Isaiah 53, 52, 53, where Christ has got to suffer. 
for the sins of the world. John saw it when he said, Behold the Lamb of God that's come to save the world from their sin. John 1.29. The suffering servant. I'm not talking about suffering because he's got a migraine. I'm talking about suffering because he bears the sins of the world on his body on the cross. The suffering servant. He has to go to the cross. He kept telling his disciples, I've got to go to Jerusalem. I'm going to be convicted of a crime I didn't commit. They're going to hang me on a cross for the sins of the world. Three days later, I'm going to be raised from the dead. And what he was talking to his disciples about was the suffering servant of Isaiah. And they were old covenant people, born again, under the covenant. They didn't understand the covenant. I'm worried that you are under the new covenant and don't understand the new covenant are making the same stupid mistakes that they made because you don't understand I can't make you understand. All I can do is teach you. But boy, I'm telling you, you need to really understand this stuff. You need to be a disciple who has the information, and you need to cycle it through your soul. Not only did he come by incarnation, he fulfilled a messianic ministry on his three and a half years of ministry. He was the suffering servant going to the death of the cross, the burial and the resurrection. And number five, he spent 40 days in post-resurrection appearances trying to train up and teach up his disciples who hadn't got it, who were not ready for the new covenant. He spoke it to them in Luke 22, and they didn't get it. They didn't get it. And so he spends 40 days in post-resurrection appearances preparing his disciples for Pentecost and the beginning of the church, the beginning of the new covenant, the actual D-Day of the new covenant. Forty days in post-resurrection appearances because we had people in the disciple corps like Doubting Thomas. During the 40 days has to be brought in to quit walking by sight and start walking by faith. I am fearful of you that you're going to be a cut off that old rug. You must understand the importance of the new covenant because that's the dynamics of your entire life on earth. The dynamics is living the dynamics of the new covenant. You will talk grace and never be able to get it functional in your life. I want the great teaching of grace to be functional in your life. We are in the dispensation of grace. You cannot mix grace and law. They nullify. You can't mix old sin nature and Holy Spirit. They nullify. You cannot do this. Law and grace do not mix any more than the old sin nature and the Holy Spirit. You cannot they do not mix. They're mutual exclusives. Apparently, I'm raising my voice for the Internet. So just relax. Listen, in that first Advent, we have him ascend and into session, seated at the right hand of God the Father, all of that's first, first advent. All of that occurs in, fu in fulfillment of the old covenant 
Matthew 5, 17, Jesus said, I didn't come, I, listen, I, I, I didn't come to abolish the law. I came to what? Fulfill it. And I wrote down the six things. These are the highlights of what it's going to take to fulfill the Messianic law and bring in the new covenant, to take care of the old covenant and bring in the new. I'll tell you what people miss about Pentecost. They miss everybody wants to, well, I don't know where the church began. Who cares at this point? I'll tell you what started at Pentecost, the new covenant. You know how I know it? Because when you take part in the cup of the Eucharist, we look back to the first coming of Christ, and we look forward to the second coming of Christ. Right? And when did that happen? When he died on the cross, was buried, raised from the dead, 40, 40 days of post-resurrection appearance, and ascended back to the Father, Acts 1.11, and ascended back to the Father, seated at right hand of God the Father, and now he's ready to come back a second time. And that difference between the first and the second that is all about the new covenant. And where was the key period? When the dispensations changed, which was at Pentecost. Wow. You've got to come to understand this stuff. You have got to understand that you're a new covenant people. And how important that is that you know how to live. Church age tells you where you're living, but listen, the new covenant tells you how you're supposed to live. You understand that? Dispensation is a period of time. New covenant is the way you operate in it. Here's the second advent. Remember, the new covenant covers the first and second advent. It is the last covenant. It is... It is the Magna Carta. It is lights out. It is the big deal. You don't let anybody tell you the new covenant doesn't trump the old covenant. It is the big deal. Here's the new covenant. Here are six highlights of the new covenant. Rapture, resurrection. That's when the church age believer is raptured and receives his resurrection body. That's a big deal. This is part of the second coming. Then we go into the judgment seat of Christ for the church. That's a big deal. Then we go into the seven years of Jewish tribulation. That's a big deal. Then we go into the millennial age. That's a big deal. Then we go to the devil and the fallen angels are cast into the lake of fire. That's a big deal. Then we have the great white throne judgment of all unbelievers, and then they're cast into the lake of fire. Now, this is a preview of coming attractions. Right? And I just hit the highlights. Just to, I hit six highlights to show you. All of that's new covenant. None of that's old covenant. All of that's new covenant. And if you're looking at anything in the Old Testament that deals with the second coming, that's prophetic. Jeremiah, Isaiah, Daniel. You're looking for prophecy out of the Old, Old Testament. You're looking for prophecies that are prophetic both to the first coming and to the second coming because they fall under new covenant thinking. I know, I know, I hear it every Sunday. I've never heard this before. I, I don't know what to tell you. What can I tell you? Go to a church where, you, where it won't be a surprise when you hear this stuff. This should not be a surprise to anybody. We've been in the church age 2,000 years. We've been under the new covenant 2,000 years, and we're still battling this out in the Christian church. Law versus grace. Morality versus spirituality. What is wrong with us? You need to get on the page. You need to quit... You need to quit for this foolishness. Just quit it. Get your head squared away and get in the game. 
Point number two. The new covenant made the old covenant obsolete. That's a pretty, that's a pretty heavy word, wouldn't you think? Obsolete. You know what obsolete is? Old and worn out. <laughs> I can relate to that. Obsolete. Means more than that, though, doesn't it? Means a whole lot more than that. Obsolete. The Bible says it's obsolete. It's obsolete because Jesus Christ fulfilled it during his first advent. We got something new. The old obsolete, the old obsolete has now become sleek and new. The old is obsolete. The new is hotter than a pistol. Who that looks good. I like that one. The old is obsolete and the new is new, fresh and ready to go. And the new covenant, no matter how many years you live under it, is still the new. Didn't you love that? And no matter how many days you spend under the old, it's old, it's worn out, it's faded away, it's vanished, it's obsolete. Why would you want to live under something like that when you got something brand new by grace? Well, Matthew 5, 17, Matthew 27, 51, I love that one. The veil drops and, and listen, and renders the old system starting with the temple. I mean, did, isn't it interesting? He started with the temple and just long before Rome got to it, he did away with it. He made, listen, when Christ died on the cross and the veil dropped, the, listen, everything that that temple represented was obsolete. because Jesus Christ had come and fulfilled it. Hebrews, the 8th and ninth and 10th chapters, along with 2 Corinthians 3 that we'll study in a moment, tell us that the new covenant is superior. God saved it to the last and saved it for his son. Hebrews, the seventh chapter, 18 through 22, explains that the old covenant was set aside after the new covenant because the old covenant was weak, useless, and could make nothing perfect. You know why? Because Christ replaced it. Now, you can go to Hebrews, the seventh chapter, 18 and 22 on your own. And you can study all that. I didn't make it up. I just picked it out. That's what, his, that's what Paul says about it, or, or the writer of Hebrews. In Hebrews 8, chapter verse 6, the writer says, Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant with better promises. <laughs> Why would you go back to something when you got the new covenant that is a guarantee of better covenant and of better promises. That old, that old obsolete thing you got, it's got no warranty with it. It's done. No, it's all with the new one. All with the new one. Do you not know that, people? Do you not know that? Hebrews, the 8th chapter, 8 through 12. For if, that's a second-class condition in the Greek language. It means contrary to fact. So you can't see that. You can't see that in English. You don't know what that if is. First-year Greek student can tell you what it is. He can look in Summer's book. He knows how to identify that. Right, Billy? Billy knows how to find a second-class condition and knows what it means.
You can't, there's no way you would know what that means in the English. But here's what it says. For if the first covenant had been faultless and it wasn't, there would have been no occasion for a second, but there was because the first covenant was faulty after Christ came. Faulty. How do you like that word? Faulty. In Hebrews, the 8th chapter, verse 13, he says, but when a, but he said, a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete, but whatever is being obsolete, growing old, is ready to disappear. And in 70 AD, part of it disappeared, and the rest of it disappeared in 100 AD. The fall of, of, of Israel to Rome and the canonization of the new covenant. <laughs> I know. Anybody worth their salt in conservative theology know two dates that I just laid out, 70, AD, and 100. They all, listen, they all agree. I don't know any that doesn't. Al, you know what I mean? I don't know. N nobody worth their salt. Anybody who's New Covenant thinking that, they know that. Here's Hebrews 10, 9, and 10. See, I'm just showing you. I'm reviewing what we have, we have studied in great detail, Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. Listen to what 10, 9, and 8 said. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, to take away the first in order to establish the second. <laughs> what did he do with the first? <clears throat> what did he do with the first? What did he do with the old one? Right? What did he do with the old one? He took it away. <clears throat> he removed it in order to establish the second one. You know what the second one is? It's the new covenant. He took it away, replaced it, <clears throat> fulfilled it. Listen to what he says. Look how, and by this will, I have come to do your will. And by this will, and what was his will? To take away the first, to establish the second. Agreed? Yes. I've come to do your will. To take away the first, to establish the second. And by this will, we, New Covenant believers, we, the church of Jesus Christ under the New Covenant, we who believe that Christ died for our sins, was buried and raised from the dead, and when we enter into Christ, we enter into a New Covenant existence. We have been sanctified, set apart unto holiness through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. You know how we got that? Now listen to me, dear hearts. You know how we got that wonderful thing of sanctification? You know how we got it? By Jesus coming, doing the will of God to replace the first by fulfilling it to establish the second called the new covenant. Do not go back to the old covenant. Get in a church that preaches a new covenant where the dynamics of the Christian life exist. The dynamics of the Christian life exist under the doctrines of the new covenant and not under the doctrines of the old. And you can't play, you can't have one foot in the law and the other in grace and think that you're in either one of them fully. Now, 2 Corinthians, third chapter. I'm going to walk you through this, baby. The whole chapter is devoted to this subject, 18 verses. It would take me 100 years to go through it, so I'm just going to give you, I'm going to highlight it. Thank you, Pam. I need a teacher. When I need a teacher, one shows up. 
This is Paul talking about the same thing Hebrews 8, 9, and 10 have talked about. I broke it into five sections. I want you to open your Bibles to the third chapter. I want you to follow through with me. I broke it into five sections. The first one is verses 1 through 4. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Mm. Or do we need, as some, letters of recommendation to you or from you? We call that transferring of letters. You are, watch this, you are our letter. You are our epistle. Written in our hearts. Known and read by all men. You know what you are under the new covenant? You are a new epistle of Christ. Written in our hearts. How did that get written in my heart? Being manifested that you are a letter, epistle of Christ, cared for by us, ministry, written, how did it get in our hearts? Now watch. Woo! Written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God. At the moment you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit began to do works for you, one of them in the indwelling was to make you wrote God wrote in your heart that you were an epistle of Christ to be read by all mankind. A walking epistle. You know, we talk about the epistle to Rome, the epistle to Galatians. He said, you're an epistle. At the moment you receive Christ as your Savior, the Holy Spirit wrote upon your heart that you are an epistle of Christ written by the Holy Spirit to be a witness of evidence that all men can read. How about that? You know what an epistle is? It's a new covenant teaching. An epistle. The book of Romans is an epistle. They're all epistles. We're an epistle. You know, you, you look at the New Testament, you go from Matthew to Revelation... There's another epistle. It is you. Mary, it's you. There is an epistle beyond the book of Revelation. It is you, dear hearts. It is each one of you. It is each one of you are an epistle of Christ written upon your heart by the Holy Spirit to be an epistle read by all mankind. And, and, and believe me when I tell you that people really do read you. Well, God blow my nose. <laughs> Excuse me. Did you know you was an, a new, did you know that you were a new covenant epistle of Christ? Did you know that? You didn't make yourself one. 
And you can't do anything to do away with it. You know why? Because at the point of salvation, it was written by the Holy Spirit of God upon your heart, an epistle of Christ to be read by all men. You need to be careful. You need to be careful how you conduct yourself with people that are close to you, like your children, your mates, your in-laws, your outlaws. Whoever you're going to meet with today, I don't know. Listen, I, can, I remember clearly as an unbeliever, especially the last two years of my unbelieving life when I was under conviction for salvation, I studied Christians like a hawk for some prey. I, didn't pay no, I never paid any attention to Christians before then until they started witnessing to me. And I got under conviction of the Holy Spirit about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then I began to watch them. I began to read them. Boy, was that a shock. I found all kinds of things. I didn't find everybody had the same, were the same book. <laughs> but I sure read them. And you would have probably never thought that old Rod Aiden was out there watching you. Walk you walk and talk you talk. See if they jived. See whether or not I want to become a Christian. And so he says, being manifest to you. Look at verse 4. And such confidence. <laughs> There's what you need, church. Confidence in the new covenant. Confidence with God that when you ask in the name of Christ, you can receive according to the will of God what you've asked for. You'll get it in his timing, but you will get it. Do you believe that? No, here's how your prayer goes. I want this, and here's my date. <laughs> and I better get it by Tuesday. You may not be bold enough to say that to God, but we live it as soon as our prayer is over. It didn't come on Tuesday as expected, so now we're bent out of shape with God. God don't answer prayers. How do you know? Well, I prayed and it didn't happen Tuesday. Oh, ye of little faith. Oh, ye of little faith. Confidence. And such confidence, that's verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, Verses 1, 2, and 3, with such confidence we have through Christ towards God. Confidence. You know where it comes from? Understanding who I am under the new covenant. You know who I am? I'm an epistle. I'm an epistle of Christ. Written by the Holy Spirit upon my heart. And I'm read by all men. Just read me all you want. Because what you will find in my life is Christ. I'm an epistle of Christ. And boy, do people watch you. I was sitting with a couple of guys the other day at Chick-fil-A at the office. When it was over and the guys left, a guy came up to me and said, can I sit down? I said, well, it's apparently second shift. Come on in. He said, I heard what you were saying to them. Who knew? Who knew? I need some clarity myself. You know? What'd that guy do? Eavesdropped. What'd he get? Living epistles talking about the dynamics of a new covenant. And he said, I want some of that. How'd those young guys get that? I tell you how. Look at verses 5 and 6. Not that we are adequate in ourselves. Well, you ought to underline that sucker. If I could get you to believe that. We are not adequate. You know what adequate means in the, in the Greek? 
it means sufficient, enough. I'm enough, I can handle it. Oh, maybe. Why not give it to God and not have to sweat over whether you can handle it or not? Yeah, right? What makes you think he wants you to handle it and sweat it out? Why don't you just cast all your cares upon him? Because he cares, and he's a caring Christ that carries your burdens. Why are you carrying them? Well, I'll just struggle through, and I'll just get to the other side, and I may be mad as an old wet hen, but I'll get there. <laughs> why, do you do, why do you even start out that way? Where did you get the idea that you had to carry the load? Well, if I don't carry it, who is? Christ. How about that? <laughs> first Peter the fifth chapter how come I never knew that because I didn't read first Peter 5 you carry so much stuff that you shouldn't carry it because it's stuff why you do that why don't you claim that verse pull that verse out and say here it is I'm putting it on you Lord Well, thank you, he says. I've been waiting five years for you to quit toting that baggage. How about that? Cast all your cares upon me, for I care for you. Well, what a wonderful thank you, Jesus, idea. Then he says, we're not adequate in ourselves. Consider anything as coming from ourselves. But our adequacy is from God Almighty. Oh, we sing it. God Almighty. God is an awesome God. But we live like he isn't. We sing it and don't live it. We don't believe it. Because when a rubber hits a pavement, it just squeals and doesn't do anything. Just sets and squeals. God, who has made us adequate as servants of a new covenant. Oh, please walk out of here as servants of a new covenant. You're going to be servants of something. <laughs> Why not be a servant of the new covenant? So that when people read your life, they see Christ of the new covenant. Not of the letter but of the spirit, for the letter kills. See the word letter? You know what that is in the Greek language? Grammar. He used two different words. The English don't show you the difference. There's a word called epistle. In the English, they called it letter. There's another word called letter in the Greek language, and it's grammar, alpha, beta, gamma. It's the Greek alphabet. Mm, I know. You can't see it unless you know a little bit. Not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills. You know what the, you know what the letter kills? Old covenant letter. It's grammar, not epistle. Now, you got to have grammar to have an epistle. But the epistle trumps the grammar because the epistle shows you know the grammar. I know the words... I know the alphabet. I can put words together. I can put sentences together. I can do, I can do a page. <laughs> I can do a book. That's an epistle. And he makes a difference. He makes a distinction. But the Spirit gives life. You see, the letter, the old covenant kills, and the new covenant gives life. Why? Because the Holy Spirit. You see... The best the law can do for you is morality, and that's not enough. Spirituality trumps morality. Spirituality of the new covenant trumps morality of the old covenant. I don't. Verse 7 through 11. If the ministry of death, old covenant, in letter engraved on stone, grammar, come, came with glory, yes, so that the sons of Israel could not look intently at the face of Moses because of the glory of his face as it was fading. 
why is it fading? Looking for the coming of Christ. And when he comes, the fading's over. It's kaput. How shall the ministry of the Spirit fail to be even more with glory? Can't. If the ministry of condemnation, Old Covenant, has glory, much more does the ministry of righteousness abound in glory, New Covenant. For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory on account of the glory which surpasses it, Old Covenant. For indeed, what had glory in this case has no glory, Old Covenant, on account of the glory that surpasses it, Jesus Christ coming in and fulfilling it, and now we're under a New Covenant. Go get him, Paul. Okay. For if that which fades away, old covenant, was with glory, because it came from God, much more looking for Christ to come, much more that which remains is in glory. You know what remains? New covenant. It fulfilled the old and became the new. 12 through 15. Having therefore, therefore, that takes care of verses 1 through 11. Having therefore, having therefore understood verses 1 through 11. And boy, has he whammed it. Out with the old, in with the new. Out with the old, in with the new. Out with the old, in with it. Right? Now, I hope so. That's where we've been. Having therefore such a hope. Confident expectation, confidence now has become hope. Such a hope, we use great boldness in our speech. I hope you've heard it today. I've been as bold as you can get without you picking up stones. You know why? I want to be read as an epistle of Christ of the new covenant. And are not as Moses, who used to put a veil over his face that the sons of Israel, Israel might not look intently at the end of what was fading away. Isn't that interesting how Paul saw that? Listen, this is, listen, this is revelation to Paul deep into the old covenant. Do you understand what I mean? Nobody in this congregation today was deep into the old covenant as much as Paul. Nobody. Anybody been out killing Christians lately? No, I didn't get so. Well, there you go. Nobody made a journey out of the pit of the old covenant like Paul made, and boy, is he pounding it. Their minds were hardened. Until this very day at the reading of the Old Covenant, the same veil remains unlifted because it is only removed in Christ. That's why you witness to Jews. And if they believe in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the veil will be removed. I got converted by one of those Jews whose veil got removed. John Haggai old Jewish preacher, long dead. Apparently, I'm wearing his shoes. But to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their heart. Old covenant. But whenever a man turns to the Lord, gospel, the veil is taken away. You know how it's taken away? Grace. Oh, it's taken away by the grace gift of salvation. Think about that. This old hard work law business is removed by grace and not of yourself. It is a gift. Look at verse 17 and 18, how he wraps this thing up. Now the Lord is the spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, there is freedom. That's Galatians 5, 1 and 13. You do know that every believer in the church age has the indwelling member, third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. 
only few people had the privilege of having access to the Holy Spirit visit them, let alone dwell in them. Very few had the privilege under the Old Covenant to have the Holy Spirit visit them, let alone dwell with them or in them. Every church-age believer has it. I want you to understand what an enormous privilege that is. And with him comes liberty and freedom from the law, from works, trying to earn favor from God that's already been gifted by grace to you. Look at verse 18. But we all, with unveiled faces, <laughs> you love that? Just come to the word of God, unveiled faces. You know why? Because I have the Holy Spirit inside teaching. And nothing's fading away. You know why they wore, you know, Paul said, you know why they wore the veil? Because it was fading away. They were ready to jump ship as it was. But now we come, the epistles of Christ written by the Holy Spirit, and I said, all men could read, unveiled faces, because we're in something that's growing, not vanishing. I keep telling you this, and I don't know if you believe it or not. It's not for me to make you believe it. It's me to tell you you ought to believe it. We live in the most privileged time of any biblical history you could ever study, the church age. New covenant. We're the last of the Mohicans, whoever they were. Please don't tell me after class. You're, you're so bright. I'd have a paper on that before I left the pulpit. But we all with unveiled face, beholding as a mirror the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image of Christ from glory to glory. From glory to glory. From being in the glory of the Lord, looking for the second coming when we are established in the glory. You read about it in Revelation 21, 22. Listen, I wrote down a few key verses for you. Whenever a person turns to the Lord, what's he mean by that? He means the moment he believes that Christ died for his sins, was buried and raised from the dead the third day. It's called the gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, Romans 1.16. And when he believes, it is that gospel and that faith in it that brings grace as a gift of Ephesians 2.8.9, not of yourself, it is a gift of God. You know, for by grace we're saved through faith. Let me conclude with four points and we'll go home. Okay? I put them at the bottom of the paper. I have four. I want to remind you. One, the old covenant leads the unsaved to the gospel of Jesus Christ, Galatians 3, 24, 25. Second, once in Christ, Christ leads you, Christ leads the saved into the new covenant teachings. There's where all your new covenant doctrines are. You got to be saved. Once you're saved, Christ leads you. The Holy Spirit takes you from him, takes you right into the new covenant teachings, the doctrines, the doctrines of the church age, the doctrines of the new covenant. This is what we pound around here all the time. You're missing some really good studies. You're missing some really good studies. 
you're missing a really good study on Tuesday night out of the life of Joseph. Oh, you say, well, I live stream with you, not with me. You might live stream with somebody, but you don't with me. If you want to live stream with me, you said in my class. You're live streaming with somebody I don't know about. Maybe in a cloud somewhere. I don't know. I need to look in your face, into your eyes, and see where we are. Life of Joseph series is a really good series. And we go from 6.30 to 7.30. And if you need a little, they bring a little bit of something to hold you over if you had to come from work. They give you a little something. I tell you, it's enough. I, I wind up eating that, and that's my supper. But, you know, it would be enough to get you home, I can tell you that. And what are we doing? We're trying to, we're taking a life, a life example of a guy and then showing you how it works under the new covenant. Listen, here's another point. The standard of spirituality is superior to the moral standard of the Mosaic law. Romans 8, 2 through 4. And people all the time say, to me, well, Ron, are you telling me that you don't believe in the Big Ten? I'm talking about Mosaic law, the Ten. Yeah, for morality. But you do know if you, if you have to keep it for spirituality to violate one is to violate them all, don't you? And you know nobody's able to keep them. You do know that, don't you? Not able to keep them all the time, all the, every day, every day. That's why it leads you to Christ for salvation, because you can't do it. Listen, the law is designed to condemn you. And the best it can do is set a moral standard for you, a standard you don't need under the new covenant because you have something superior to it. It's called walking in the spirit under the doctrines of the new covenant. Please, people, please, 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 get in the game. We need all of you to be players in the game. Get off the bench. Get off the bleachers. Get in the game with us. My final point, new covenant believers are released from the conditional messianic covenants like the Adamic and Mosaic by the grace gospel of Jesus Christ, Paul, Romans 7, 6. But now we have been released from the law, having died to that which we were once bound, so that divine purpose we serve in the newness of the Holy Spirit and not in the oldness of the grammar of the Old Covenant. See, we tell our guys who go through language school here, you got to know the alphabet. If you learn the alphabet, I can teach you anything. If you learn, don't learn. See, and that's what they're saying. Listen, Christ wants to write epistles in you, and you're still dealing with the alphabet. Get out of the alphabet and get into epistle. <laughs> well, let me, let me speak a moment about Father's Day, and then we'll go home. Rick, you'll lead us in a pledge here in a moment. If you have a father, you should call him today. At least tell him one thing that's been beneficial to your life from experiencing his life with you. Is that too hard to do? One thing. For some of us, Maybe I like myself, Tony. We don't have fathers. I never had a father. I had a father, obviously. But, 
but he died in the Second World War, and I, I, I didn't know him at all. But I had a wonderful father figure in my life, my grandfather. My grandfather stepped up the plate for a young guy. My grandfather already had a tribe of kids. He had uh, two, and he married a woman with maybe five. Deanna will tell me afterwards. She keeps up with all that stuff. And then uh, took me. Th then they, my grandfather and grandmother had one, Nancy, and then they took me. Nancy is four years older than I am. And then they took me in and raised me. And uh, I've told this before, but I was in the first grade. And uh, the teacher kept calling Roll and kept calling Adama. And I didn't respond because I thought I was a homan. And she finally came over to me and said, Ronnie, I've been calling you. What, what are you what, why aren't you answering me? There's only like 20 kids in the whole school. We all went to one, you know, one, one room schoolhouse with one teacher, so it wasn't like we didn't all know everybody. And I went, I'm a homan. I never heard of homan. That was my grandfather. I wasn't trying to be disrespectful. I never heard Adama. Who's Adama? Well, that's you. I don't think so. <laughs> and boy, I went storming home. I burst through that door. It didn't matter how good the cookie smelled. I approached my grandmother and wanted to know what's going on. Now, I was mad. That teacher didn't know my name, called me by some name. Adama. Now I had to learn to write a whole new name. Do you know how difficult it is? I just learned to spell whole man. Now I got to spell a name and pronounce it correct. I mean, who can pronounce Adama correct? I had a wonderful grandfather. And uh, he poured more into me than I could ever give him credit for or take out. And I'm so thankful that over the years I had such a deep appreciation as a kid because somehow as a little kid I just knew that they went beyond the call of duty for me and gave me a home and a place to live and to call, I could call it my home and my family. I'm so deeply appreciative of it. And uh, they're no longer with me and I wish it was because Father's Day was a day I always called Grandpa. I told Grandpa some story that touched my life. And I'll tell you, my grandfather always loved some story that I would tell him how he touched my life. Do that today. Do that. Touch somebody else's life. There's got to be at least one thing. If nothing else, tell them how your heavenly father has touched you and wish you would touch them. This is a day to tell somebody about some reason, some way that that parent touched your life in such an ex a wonderful, and those of us that have lost them, we would really like to do it. I've, I've got a lot of stories in my heart that I never told my grandfather that I thought over the years telling my grandkids. I wish I could tell, tell him. Father, we're so thankful today for your love and mercy and grace. For these that have come our way to study with us by the automobile and the internet. I'm thankful for the internet. I hope they don't misunderstand me. I'm thankful that the shut-ins and the people in long distance that can't drive. Those who have emergencies and they can pick us up on their cell phones and things like that. It's a wonderful thing and John Dyer does a marvelous job with that. But for those who can come, I need face-to-face -face people. I need, to, I need to see the people, talk with them, pray with them, listen to their stories, be part of their life. It's very difficult to do it long distance with people you don't know. But for those that are close, this is what the body of Christ is about on a local level. That's important to me as a pastor. 
Well, we thank you, Father. Father, we're about to take our offering. I don't want to get Mary nervous here. We're going to give under the basis of grace and not law. We're going to do it joyfully. I want to thank you for the many ways the Holy Spirit leads us to bless people with our finances and to encourage them in their walk. For we've made our prayer this Father's Day. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen.